Your Honor, good, good morning. morning. Good morning, Paul. Your Honor, um, I am here on behalf of the Florida Bar, in particular the Center on Professionalism, and we have a historic video series we're doing in which we're interviewing some of the recognized leaders in the profession to establish a, an oral history of the profession. So thank you for joining us. Well, thank you for inviting me. Your Honor, I'd like to first ask you for an oral history of your background so our viewers can get a sense of how you got to where you are. Well, thank you. And I thank the Florida Bar for this worthwhile project. We have many fine judges uh, and it's that have been in this district and I'm so glad that you've been able to preserve their history such as Judge Dyer and Judge Atkins and others. I was born in Dade County in 1932. They say a woman who'll tell her age will tell anything but I think that's part of my history. I was born in the midst of the depression here in Miami. Uh, I went to public schools, uh, elementary school and high schools here in Miami. I uh, went the first two years to Stevens College in Columbia, Missouri, which at that time was just for women. In the 1950s, many of our parents of that era didn't think it was safe to send their daughters off to a four-year college uh, with the men and women. So we, they sort of nudged us into the world by going to a, a woman's college for, uh, in my case, two years. And then I went on to Northwestern University in Evanston, Illinois, and received a, a degree, a BS degree in 1954. I, I actually was interested in television production at that time, but I got a degree in, uh, from the School of Speech in uh, secondary education and so I was prepared to be a teacher, as all of us did in those days. Women always, there were very few things women could do. We could be secretaries, teachers, and very few of us were, were lawyers at that time. Uh, my uh, uncle was a lawyer. He had practiced in Providence, Rhode Island for years, and I admired him greatly. So when I came back after graduating in the summer of 1954, my mother said, what are you going to do? And although I had some job offers in Chicago, uh, she said to me, why don't you go to law school? So I applied and I went to the University of Florida the first year and I was the only woman in my class. In fact, there was an article in the paper at that time, 99 men and a woman. Um, at the end of my first year, my mother became ill and my father asked if I would come down to Miami and be with her. Uh, we lived near the University of Miami. And she had a prolonged illness, but she did live to see me graduate. So I actually graduated from the University of Miami Law School in 1957. And then I uh, went to Tallahassee to seek a job. And I was very naive in those days. I just walked around the streets of Tallahassee and saw buildings with names on them, like Workmen's Compensation Division, uh, Supreme Court, and walked in and said, Does, can I? Can I have got a job here? I have my law degree. Well, in any event, it was in the summer, and Tallahassee's very sleepy and slow in the summer, and I walked into the Workman's Compensation Building, and I met Rodney Durant, who was the director for years, and he, she was very kind to see me. Secretary said, there's a young woman here who wants a job. So I was so naive that I actually thought that I could be a Workman's Compensation judge if I applied and had the credentials. Well, yeah, I did not have the credentials, of course, and little did I know it was a political appointment. But in any way, I guess he admired my spunk because he said, but I do know someone who might offer you a job. And he said, I don't have anything here. When he was very kind to me and uh, said, but uh, maybe I can find something for you. So the first district court of appeal, well, the courts of appeal were just being established in 1957, first, second, and third courts of, district courts of appeal. So there was a judge who was the chief judge of that court, Judge Wallace Sturgis, who needed a law clerk. Well, fortunately for me, Judge Sturgis, unlike many men of that era, had had experience with uh, women attorneys in his office in Ocala. And uh, he interviewed me that same day, and I was hired to be his law clerk. There was another lawyer from Miami who was in my same class, and he was uh, 
hired to be a law clerk the same day by another judge. Now, Judge Sturgis was a wonderful man. He came to my wedding. He was, I loved him very dearly as a friend and mentor. But he was very strict about uh, women and what they should do or not do. He had graduated from the University of Mississippi in 1920. That will give you a little idea of him. So he was, he was a, a character and, and in the era that he was raised in. In any event, he just told me from the very beginning that I would not be receiving the same salary that the male law clerks did because I did not have the responsibility of a family. Well, I did not disagree. I just said, yes, I was glad to get the job. Well, within a month, he raised my salary to that of the men law clerks. Uh, he also told me that at all times I had to wear hosiery, and I had no intention of doing anything else, and then I wasn't allowed to wear slacks to the office, pants as he called them. And uh, having gone to a girls' school, remember, I mean, I hadn't having had to wear white gloves to church on Sundays, and I had to dress for dinner, and this, of course, did not come as a shock to me. So, in any event, I was there for two years. Uh, I met my husband, Joe Nesbitt, Joseph Nesbitt, who was now a judge in the Third District Court of Appeal. Uh, in law school, and uh, I was in Tallahassee, and about two weeks, and the phone rang, and he said, I too have a job up here. And so uh, we uh, dated, and I passed the bar, and he passed the bar, and we got married. And uh, in, let's see, uh, how, how about long did three you, years later. Yeah, how long did you work at the, at the first? At, at the Court of Appeals? Yes. Two years, for two years. Then I came down to Miami, and um, my husband and I opened up our law firm, Nesbitt and Nesbitt, and uh, then we, we practiced law together, but it was very hard for me to get clients because they always wanted the mail of the office. You know, when they would come in, my father was a real estate broker, and he uh, directed some clients to us, and they would say, well, we're, which are, where are the Nesbitts? And I'd introduce myself, and my husband would introduce himself, and they invariably would go for him. Because I, you know, in those days they just thought men were the lawyers and women were the assistants or secretaries in the office. Well, in any event, dear Paul Lewis, another friend of mine, a lawyer who I admire, said to me one day, Lenore, why don't you go down to the uh, Dade County Law Library? They need a research assistant. And I thought, well, that's a good idea. I could get a, my own salary and not have to share the fees with my husband. So I ran into yet another barrier as being a woman in that, in that time in 1957. There was a, an, an experienced judge who was, had retired and uh, he had been uh, on the bench quite some time and he was a little bit of a curmudgeon and uh, I went to see him about the position and the day that I went his secretary was ill and so I, the phone was ringing so I just sat down and answered the phone and took him messages and finally after everything calmed down he said well um, what are you here for and I told him I want to apply for a job to be a research assistant now there were only seven circuit judges at that time he said I don't know whether these male judges will listen to you and besides that you may get pregnant I said well I don't know about that just give me a chance so uh, I'd been married almost 10 years and I had, didn't have a baby so I said well I don't think that's going to happen in any event I was there uh, for a year and a half, and um, I became the only research assistant after a while. There were only two at the time, and I and I did have my first child in 1965. And that, but I worked through my pregnancy, and then I took some time off, and I had two children in two years. And then when I came back, I went worked in a, a law firm, and pe people often asked me, "Were you a litigator?" No, I wasn't. I was basically an, an office lawyer. I did appeals. I did uh, general corporate work. We represented a few corporations and a bank. I, my husband went on the bench, the circuit court bench, and uh, I took over his part of the practice, and including being an assistant, uh, well, a counsel for the State Board of Medical Examiners from 1970 to 1971. And then I was appointed to the circuit court bench as the, the first woman merit appointee. It was the first time that the merit commission had been uh, composed to uh, screen candidates. Up until that time, the governor just made his selection on his own. 
without any help from a bar committee. Uh, so I was appointed to circuit court bench in 1975. And I stayed there until 1983 when I was appointed to this federal bench. And I went senior, on senior status in July of um, 1990, last year, 1998. That's a <laughs> wonderful story. Um, j you did mention this during your uh, talk, but were there certain mentors that you did have along the way? I know you mentioned some. Were there others that yes. you had along the way? Yes. Could you share that? Uh, a woman lawyer that, who was older, uh, who had gone to law school with me at the University of Miami and who passed away two years ago, and that was very loved by many members of the bar. She practiced with Steve Zach's firm, was Bertha Claire Lee. I don't know if you knew her or not, but she was a, a wonderful woman and a fine lawyer. Uh, that, uh, Bertha Lee practiced with Paul Lewis, who I've referred to, and they were down the hall from my husband and I in the Dupont building. And I'll never forget some of the, not only legal assistance she gave me as far as, she, she was a great writer and she would critique some of my work. But she was, as I said, older and was very helpful in helping me adjust to a man's world of, of law. I remember one day I was in her library doing some research and the phone rang and uh, it was a, lawyer tracking me down about a discovery matter and he was very very abusive to me and um, used some foul language so I put down the phone to talking with him and I started to cry and she came in and she said why are you crying I said well because this man said these terrible things to me about discovery and made some demands on me she said now that is the last time I want to have to see you cry, particularly over some man lawyer. She said, so don't ever do that again, and I haven't. But she was a wonderful help to me and very supportive, and I remember her as a good friend and spoke at her uh, services at the time of her passing. Another mentor to me was uh, retired Judge Eaton, and I spoke of those few circuit judges that were in the state system, and he was one of them then. He became a federal judge here years later. He gave me some sage advice through those years when I would do some research for him. And one thing I always remember, he said, always listen to the lawyer that you're you think you're going to rule against because you might learn something. <laughs> and he had some wonderful homilisms uh, that he would, uh, passed on to me. And uh, those are two that I remember in particular. There are others that probably members of the bar now do not remember, but Judge Paul Barnes had served on the Florida Supreme Court and he taught at the University of Miami Civil Procedure. And he always said, you have to know those rules, those rules, those darn rules. It's, the, it's a framework for our whole legal society. Don't be innovative, don't be creative about how to handle a lawsuit. First start with the rules and follow them. They're there to help you. Judge, although heroes may be sometimes the same as mentors and maybe not. Um, w are there any people along the way that you considered a hero of yours? Mm -hmm. Well, two. Judge David Dyer, who I have a picture here of him with me, and I'm with him, rather, at the goodbye party for Judge Dyer, who was a federal judge from the 1970s until he passed away last year. He was a wonderful man, a very kind um, judge, a very good judge, a very firm but fair judge, and always took the time to speak to me uh, and inquire about me and what I was doing. And I admired him greatly, and he was greatly loved and admired by the bar in general. Uh, also, Judge Peter Fay, uh, whom I had been to that first year of Florida Law School with, and uh, through the years, he has always been a, a supporter of mine and been very kind to me and taken time to ask about my career and about my family. Uh, he, is, in the beginning, I went to him and said, Judge Fay, how am I ever going to handle some of these areas of law that I don't know anything about, such as admiralty and bankruptcy? And he was in his uh, chambers and he turned around and he pointed to the federal statutes and he said, just take 
a book down that applies to the statute you are concerned about and go from there. So just take one book, one statute, the annotations, and one ticket a talk. And I have, and uh, last year, when Judge, uh, or two years ago rather, when Judge Aronovitz passed away, I agreed to take all the bankruptcy appeals, which he had been handling at that time. So I guess I came a long way from not knowing where the bankruptcy code was to uh, handling those appeals. So those are two men that I think of. And then the other, a heroine from afar, and I have met her and I have talked to her at length, is Justice Sandra J. O'Connor. Uh, she uh, graduated from law school two years before, uh, before I did, and she had many of the same experiences that I had. She could not get a job with a, uh, a law firm. They, uh, she, you know, I shared the same experience. The law firms would say, well, you, had good, you have good grades, I'd like to hire you, but what will our male lawyers think and what will our clients think? And they had no embarrassment about just telling us that straight out. And um, then she worked for um, the federal government for a short time and then went into uh, the state uh, administrative system and then became a state Supreme Court justice and then went to the United States Supreme Court. I chatted with her one day a few years ago for about an hour on she oh, was a wonderful, warm, friendly, kind woman and was very interested in some of our common experiences. Let me uh, change a little bit here and ask you, do you have any core beliefs that have helped you through the years in the good or bad times that you could share with us? Courage. Courage to do the right thing, whether it's politically popular or not. Honesty and commitment to the task at hand, whatever it takes or how many hours it takes. And uh, to try to be firm but fair and try to be knowledgeable about the case at hand or the situation at hand. Again, similar, uh, I'm sorry. No, that's it. Similar to that, but maybe a little different. Um, what is your basic philosophy of life, um, which well, has, has helped you through? I told you I was born as a child of the Depression, and um, we were very home-centered growing up, my sister and I. And I believe that one's religious beliefs and one's families and one's friends uh, are very important to a person going through life. I don't think that you can just do it alone. I think you have to have the support of good friends, not a lot of friends, just a few good friends, and your family, and whatever religious belief that you follow, you, you've got to have that as an anchor to get you through the next week. Thank you. I want to change gears on us now and talk some about the profession of law. Mm -hmm. um, I'll ask a, 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 this question. Have you seen changes in the profession since you got into it? And if so, the change is good, bad, or what's your thoughts on it? Mm -hmm. Well, there were a lot fewer lawyers when I graduated. And, they, and there were fewer lawyers. There were fewer issues, you might say, uh, to deal with. There were fewer laws. There were fewer case decisions. Uh, so it, frankly, the law was not as complicated then. Uh, the lawyers were a much smaller group and more of an elitist group. You would go to the Florida Bar Convention and it would just be a very small group of lawyers who were always the leaders in the bar. Um, and I think that the advent of television, all the law-related movies, all the books about law and lawyers, television in the courtroom, has increased awareness of lawyers and puts more pressures on lawyers, I think. The public now views a lawyer as someone perhaps to be uh, 
with some suspicion and hostility, which I think is wrong. I think that lawyers have a very hard time of it. I, I feel that lawyers have a bad rap these days about jokes made about lawyers and um, cartoons about lawyers, funny stories about lawyers, and that they're not in, in, said in a kindly way. And just from my own standpoint, I. I don't let my family give me any of those calendars that have a joke about a lawyer every day and not too nice a joke. And I discourage any joke books about lawyers, uh, judges for that matter. I don't think it's a funny matter. I think that uh, lawyers take, by and large, take their work very seriously and they try to do the right thing and that the seminars on civility and professionalism that I've been to and you've been the leader of many of instances as I look around the room the the finest lawyers are there and they're they're the ones that really don't need to be there I think there needs to be a reach out to more of the lawyers that um, perhaps, perhaps warrant some of those jokes and stories that go around about the lawyers we've always had good lawyers we've always had lawyers even in the Bible there's a reference to uh, the apostles being released from prison because of a teacher of the law that spoke to someone who was in a position to release them but by the, our very nature as advocates and um, uh, we're always uh, viewed with uh, some type of you know uncertainty or hostility by the public and I think a great deal has been done now that wasn't done in the, the past when I first graduated to make lawyers aware of their uh, commitment to the community and how to, how to spread the word so to speak that we're trying to do the right thing and I noticed in this week's Florida Bar News for example that Edith Osmond the new president of the bar has a new logo that she's going to communicate through education to, in the schools and through the uh, Lawyer Speakers Bureau, protecting the rights, pursuing justice, and promoting professionalism. And I was impressed that she said that we don't really need to have too many new rules. We have enough rules. We just need to get the word out about how lawyers are committed to those three standards. Do you see a difference uh, between professionalism and ethics and if so, how would you um, discuss those differences? Well, I think that ethics are something that you have to apply into every area of your life. Being honest, being straightforward, uh, having integrity. I would say that those same qualities make up a part of professionalism, but beyond that is a profession. Law, a law as a profession requires us to, and particularly I will say as lawyers and judges, to communicate with each other more, to be more learned about current laws, to be able to know what's current in emerging areas of law. Another article that I just came upon the other day was, for example, was the ABA is urging changes to allow lawyers to partner with professionals other than other disciplines. It's called a multidisciplinary practice. This is something that's a complete change from the old rules about no fee splitting with accountants or other paraprofessionals, so to speak, such as health care providers. But now the American Bar Association is recommending that lawyers be able to be able to partner with other professionals, and the Florida Bar is has that under consideration. Now, if this passes, we're going to have to, this is another area of our profession that we're going to have to learn about. So I think learning and keeping up to date is part of being a good professional. Would you have any recommendations that you could share with either the law schools initially as to what you would like to see new or different in law school training mm -hmm. um, for the young lawyers? Mm -hmm. Well, I have very strong beliefs about this. I think that some law schools allow the students to choose the, some elective courses too soon. I think that there should be two solid years of the basics. Contract law, civil procedure, criminal law, constitutional law, uh, and then only in the third year should uh, students be allowed to take electives. 
I don't think that they know enough about what they want to study until they're at that stage of their career. Now, when I went to law school, we didn't have a course on ethics or professionalism. I think that's an important course, and I think that it should be given every year law school in some form or fashion, whether it be by a classroom setting or by re requiring the students to go to seminars or lectures. And I've been to one at the University of Miami Law School that you uh, chaired, and I was outstanding. Several students, several students, I think there were a couple of hundred students were there, and that, that was wonderful, that having judges to speak to about, about professionalism. So we need to do more of that in the, in the schools. We're going to take a short break and just change the tape here. Your Honor, um, now that we've talked a little bit about the schools, are there any thoughts that um, you have concerning either the bar or the bench recommendations mm -hmm. that you would have as to the better or more efficient practice of law? Mm -hmm. Well, I think that communications is important. Again, when I was first initiated the bar, it was unheard of that judges and uh, lawyers would serve on the same court committees, for example, would serve on the same, let's say, uh, program, seminars, etc. I mean, they were the judges were more or less in their ivory towers, with the exception of meeting lawyers and perhaps bar, at bar meetings or in civic committee meetings. But now, at least our court has made a concerted effort, the, our federal court here, to, to have many committees that are made up of lawyers, and there's always a judge member on each court committee along with lawyers with the exception of the committee that recommends to judges when they may perhaps been a little um, hard on a lawyer. That's, we've got that committee, and that's a, that's a difficult committee for lawyers to be on. We, we, Judge Bob Josephsburg chaired that committee for quite some time. But we have a rules committee. We have a bench bar committee that helps the court with projects, and they've helped us uh, get more judges and helped us obtain the uh, James Lawrence King building and helped us uh, re remodel the uh, David Dyer building, so they're a great help to us. I think it's important for uh, uh, judges to go to, b to bar activities, uh, bar receptions, uh, participate with the bar in uh, s uh, panel discussions of matters of common interest. And I think that uh, we need to have a more uh, cooperation and communication between judges and lawyers so that they uh, will understand our common needs and, and common interests and our common problems. I want to uh, now focus on young lawyers. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'd like to ask you um, thoughts you'd like to share with young lawyers. Right. Well, it's often said that lawyers must love the law. The law is a je jealous mistress. The law is a jealous master. But I would like to go a little further and say, but you, uh, you must love the law. Uh, and the law must love you. And the law must love you. Now, what do I mean by that? Many young lawyers got out of law school well, go, I'll go back, go to law school, because they just don't know what else to do. They say, well, here I am with a four-year degree. I think I'll go to law school. Then they go to law school, and they say, now I spent all this time in law school, I better be a lawyer. And maybe it's not the right thing for them. And I would encourage young lawyers, if, if you're out in the profession for maybe three years, and you don't like it, and you're miserable, and you're unhappy, then try to do something else that's business-related, because the law is a very, very dedicated profession. You must treat it with all the care that you treat a life's partnership, such as a marriage. The law is like a marriage. You have to, by word and deeds, uh, support it and nurture it, and you have to spend time on it. And uh, you have to be 
uh, kind and loving and, uh, and d dedicated in order to weather the inevitable frustrations and disappointments that come to lawyers and that even with, that come in a, in a life partnership. Uh, if you can do that and you feel that way about law as you would a life's partner, then you'll have a wonderful and rewarding experience. And the law will love you and you'll love the law. Um, I, I, I asked this question and um, it's, um, it's a little whimsical, but uh, let me throw it out to you, Your Honor. If you had a magic wand and you could change anything in the law at any level, um, how would you use it? Do you mean in terms of the practice of law or do you mean as far as law as far as statutes are concerned? Any way you want to interpret it. I would ask, I would hope that lawyers could be happier about what they do. I have read some statistics recently which are very um, disheartening and that is that only about 28 percent of lawyers are happy with what they do. And I wish that I could find some way uh, to make lawyers happy about the work. I always said that I never had any problems as a practicing lawyer. I only had other people's problems. And lawyers, unlike most other professions with perhaps the ministry, exception of the ministry, they have problems, problems, problems all day long. They have problems with their clients. They have problems getting clients. They have problems keeping clients. They have problems recording their fees, keeping them accurate, making their partners happy, making judges happy, making other judges happy uh, because you can't be before them when you're before another judge, and keeping your family life happy. And it's harder than any other profession, I do believe. And uh, that's the one thing that I wish I could be Cinderella about. Thank you. <laughs> Your Honor, I, I guess in, in conclusion, is there anything that you would like to share with the people that could be listening to this? And these are law students, lawyers, professors, other judges, is there anything that you would like to share with us um, on any level? Well, I think I've said it when I said you must love the law and the law must love you. I'd like you to think about that. And I just want you to not just go along on the legal path forever and be miserable if it's not right for you. And I would think that you ought to keep evaluating your options. Nothing in life is easy. But I have seen a lot of young lawyers that are very disenchanted with what they're doing, and that should not be. You have to spend many, many hours on being a lawyer and being in court, and you should try to like it. Judge, uh, thank you for welcome. taking the time You're to welcome. be with us, and uh, it's an absolute delight. Thank you very much, Paul, and thank you for all you're doing for ethics and professionalism with the Florida Bar and the University of Miami. Thank you. Good day.